Hey, how y'all doing out there in YouTube land? This is the letter coming at you from the Wild Wild West. And today, today, we got a redo. I had a major blooper in the one I did for Lucky yesterday. I, I was calling his con Austrian combat knife an FM-81. It's not an FM-81. It's an FM-78. I got confused because the video I watched to learn something about it. Hey, sweetie was talking about old the old original version which was has different markings and the paint finish is different or the the blade finish I'd say is different it has a matte finish instead of a glossy finish and the emblem's different so I, I I thought this might be the newer version the 80 you know from the 81 series or whatever but the 81 series is the one with the saw back the saw back spine this one doesn't have the saw back spine this has a plain spine so this is the 78. Just wanted to correct it. I didn't want that other video to stay out there with you know bad information about the about the item. So I decided to just redo it. But anyway, I got Juno here helping me. She's gonna help me do the video. That's yes, my girl. And let's get let's get this party started. And I just I kept everything in the boxes because I just wanted to show you how I store my things. I put them in the safe, I keep them in the boxes so they stay like they're brand new. This one doesn't have a box, so I store it in a, in a cushioned, um, I don't know, zip, zip, zip up sleeve or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, let's get to it. Here's Lucky's knife. FM78. And I do believe this is called the, the Dark Earth. The Dark Earth. This is an Austrian soldier's knife, combat knife. This is issued to Austrian soldiers. And there's other European and even some Asian militaries that use this knife also as an issued knife. This model right here, according to what my research told me, is an FM-78 and it was originally designed in 1978. But this isn't one of the original ones because it's a newer it's a newer version of that same knife with a glossy finish and it has a different markings on the handle. It's a beautiful knife. Well anyway, let's, let's unbox all these others that I got to compare it to. As you can see, this is my trench knife, and you can see how much it originally cost. $39.95. Made by Camille's Cutlery. These are no longer made because Camille's Cutlery doesn't exist anymore. All these knives are knives that have seen combat with soldiers. That's, that's the... That's what it takes for these, for these knives to qualify to be in this video. They have to be real combat knives. Representing knives that actually have seen combat. Now, none of my knives have seen combat because they were all purchased brand new. <laughs> this is my K-Bar. I got to replace the one that my father gave me that he carried in World War II. M3 trench knife. And most of you guys have seen these before, because I've made other videos with them in it. But this one's a new one today. One of my favorites, the EK-44. The one that General Patton carried, World War II.
remake of it. This is a K-Bar version of it. And the other new kid on the block, that's mine, that I absolutely love, is my Phoenix 2 from Kizlire. I'm not sure if I'm saying that name right. It's a Russian knife from the Russian Federation. And these are issued to the Russian Army and Special Forces. This one's made out of Oz 8 steel, stainless steel. Has an over molded full tang handle. Very strong, very tough knife. And actually, I think it's one of my favorites out of all these knives. Because I just love the way it feels in my hand. And I've seen this, I've seen these tested. And these are super tough knives. Comes with a leather sheath that has a plastic insert, nice big drainage hole. These are my combat knives. This one's Lucky's. If interested, if you're interested in these, the one that Lucky had, the FM78, I couldn't find the FM78, but I did find the FM81. The FM81, the difference between these two is that the FM81 has a saw back. And they're going on sale right now for $29.99 on Midway USA. I went and got one because I wanted one for my collection. So if anybody else is interested, you can go get yourself one too. Or order a black one. I think they're pretty cool. These have a polymer handle with a polymer sheath. The blade, I understand from what I've learned on the videos, the YouTube videos, even though I couldn't find any information on it from people who are selling them, but the YouTube video claims that, that, that I watched that's on the, that was on the history of these knives says that they're made out of 1095 HC carbon steel, high carbon steel. So it's a very tough knife too. It'll be easy to resharpen in the field. 1095 high, high carbon steel actually holds the edge better than like the lower carbon steels. That's one advantage of 1095. The, the disadvantage to it is that it's not as tough as the lower, lower carbon spring steels. So it's sort of a trade-off. But it's a lot tougher than stainless steels and, other, and lots of other kinds of steels, though, that aren't carbon steels. Absolutely love it. The handle... This is a cap. And the reason why it's shaped like that is because this is hollow down to about right here. And it has a steel tube inside of it that's welded to the blade tang. The blade tang only comes up to right about here, then it's welded to the steel tube. And you have two holes on the, each side. You pop out this cap and you can stick something in here like a pole or, or a steel tube, another steel tube or, or wood or what have you, whatever you can find and you can make a spear. Or you can use it as a place to stash survival things. This knife was also used as a bayonet. I don't know which weapon it was used for. I'm sure it's an Austrian rifle or something like that. But that's the reason why this is shaped like that. It's made to fit onto a rifle. It's called the FM78 Field Knife. It's a military issued knife for Austrian soldiers, German soldiers, and other, other European countries. Lots of other European countries use this. And also a few Asian countries still use it. The blade thickness is five millimeters. The handle length, I mean, the, the blade length is uh, six and a half inches. It 
Let's get into comparing it to some of these others. I think the one that it closest, most closely compares to would be the M3 trench knife. And later on, this one was one that was turned into, let me set the sheets away. Later on, this one was turned into a, um, a bayonet also. The other one I feel is close to is Patton's knife, the EK-44. EK-44, if the original one was, was pretty much like this one, I would say this is one of the toughest daggers I have ever seen. It's basically a slab of 1095, this one's 1095 chrome, chromium vanadium steel. Back in the day though, they only had 1095 HC. Chromium vanadium act, adds strength to it and it makes it a little bit more rust resistant, corrosion resistant. But this one has a very thick blade that, that the edge, that the blade thickness remains throughout the entire blade. And then the edges are just sharpened. It's like a, it's like a, a somebody took a, a, a bar of 1095 steel, shaped it like a spear, and then sharpened the, sharpened the bar of steel. <laughs> it's a full tang knife. So this is a super tough knife. Extremely tough. The original ones, I think, had wood handles. They were shaped like this, but they were made out of wood. This one has like an FRN material, I, I believe. One of my other favorite combat knives, historical combat knives, is the K-Bar. Everybody knows about the K-Bar. I don't even need to go into discussion on this one. This is the USMC version. My father was a Marine, so I got one to replace what he had. American made. These three are, are American soldiers' knives that have been around since World War II. The M3 trench knife started out as a, para, as a um, paratrooper's knife. And it turned into a service knife, but it wasn't that popular with regular army people because it was only basically good for stabbing. It wasn't very good as a field knife. So the K-Bar sort of took over. K-Bars weren't during World War II weren't called, the, the company that manufactured was the name of their company wasn't K-Bar yet. I, I don't believe that happened until after World War II. Every company and every manufacturer around the world, I mean not around the world, but in the United States that manufactured knives and guns and weapons joined in on the, on, on the um, World War II to help, help make uh, tools for soldiers, weapons and tools for soldiers. Same thing goes for the automakers and, and also the, the motorcycle, Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson, it was hard to get a Harley Davidson during that period because all the bikes were dedicated, they were dedicated to making um, military bikes for soldiers overseas. This one right here, the Phoenix Tube from Russia, this is an awesome knife. This is the knife that is basically the knife that Tox um, got permission to, to copy this to blade design to make the Wild Pig Hunter. Yes. And the original Phoenix is actually even a little bit longer than the Wild Pig Hunter. The blade length, I think, is, uh, if I remember right, is, a, is eight and a quarter inches long. The Wild Pig Hunter, if you measure it from the guard all the way up to, or the handle all the way up to the blade tip is eight inches. But the American version is not hollow ground like this. It's a saber ground, saber ground blade. So it's probably a little bit tougher and it's thicker too. I believe it's six millimeter or a little bit over six millimeters. And the Russian version, the original Russian version, the Phoenix One, 
that is 5.4 millimeters and I believe this one's four millimeters. Let's measure everything and, and weigh everything and we'll, we'll see how big everything is. So let me see, first let's do thickness. Let's zero out. Hope everybody's doing good out there. Today's Friday, May 3rd, and not May 3rd, but June, June 3rd, June 3rd. Let me get my dates right. June 3rd, we're all zeroed out here. Okay, thickness on the K-bar. 4 point, four and a quarter, 4.24 millimeters. Thickness on the EK, EK44. 3.7 or 3.8 millimeters, almost four millimeters. I'm gonna, read, I'm, I'm gonna see how big the butt in is. Yep, the same thickness, 3.8. The trench knife, the M3 trench knife, 4.7 millimeters, almost five millimeters thick. The Austrian field knife, the FM78, 5.2 millimeter, oh two millimeters thick. The Russian knife, the Phoenix One, I mean Phoenix Two, oh, that's thicker than I thought it was, 5.35 millimeters. Let me zero out again, just to make sure. Yep, 5.37 millimeters. So I'm not sure now, I'm not sure if this is one, is, is the same thick, it must be the same thickness as the bigger one, or maybe the bigger one's thicker than I think it is. Because I've, I've never seen or held the, or, or uh, used the bigger one before. The, the original one, the, the Phoenix one. But I, I, I thought it was under the understanding that it was thicker than this one, thicker and longer. But maybe they have the same thickness, maybe it's just a matter of length. Or maybe the, the, the Phoenix one is thicker, it might be a six millimeter knife, just like the, the Wild Pig Hunter, I don't know. Maybe one of y'all can fight, figure that one out. Let's weigh them out, let's see which ones are the lightest. I know this is probably going to be the heaviest one. This is a K-bar. Even though it has, it doesn't have a super thick, let me compare it to this one that's made the same way. The Camille's trench knife is actually looks like it's a little bit more robust. The, the blade tang or the rat's tail is more robust than the K-bar. So this one actually looks like it might be stronger. That's, what, that's my point. As far as like doing impact type stuff but you know what this one fills your hand i can see why this one has been a con uh, you know su such a successful combat knife for so long with our troops it just feels good in the hand and one thing that's important about a combat knife if you ask me is the grip because grip is what gives you confidence if you have to use it and this grip is awesome. This one, this one feels good either in the leather or the, in the um, Creighton handles. I think I prefer the Creighton handle a little bit more if I was to pick between the two because number one, it just feels, I just like the way Creighton feels in my hand. It just like has a sticky feeling to your hand. It feels like it's glued to your hand, like it's not gonna come out. But this one feels really good too. This one feels really good too. Let's see how much it weighs. Try to set this up so we can both see it. Ten point nine ounces. Ten point nine ounces. So this is the heaviest so far. Let's figure out what's not. What's the second heaviest? 
And I would say this is this one has to be the second heaviest because this one's a full tang knife. Even though it was 3.8 millimeter, which is it's, it's, it's a little bit thinner than the rest of the knife, or it's a millimeter of the thickness of the blade. But it's, it's a full tang knife and it's long. <coughs> Excuse me. Ten point five ounces. Ten point five ounces. Just a little bit lighter than the than the K bar. And the, this this is a remake of the original EK. It's not the original EK. It's a remake of it. Like and K bar got got the permission to make the EK knives. Eight point five ounces for my Camellia's trench knife. These are still being made. They're they're made by Oak Oak uh, Ontario Knife. Cutlery it was OKC. Ontario is making these right now. This one when I first got it was ninety um, thirty nine dollars, and this one was like forty something bucks, if I remember right. Let me look at that. It's one reason why I like to keep all the original packaging and everything. My USMC K bar was forty eight dollars and ninety five cents, forty nine dollars. I originally bought it back in the day. <laughs> I've had it for a while now. I don't know what they cost now, but I'm sure they cost more than $48. 8.5 ounces for the trench knife, for the M3 trench knife. I have a funny feeling this one's the lightest. It feels the lightest. It's probably because it's got partially hollowed out handle. But the, the tube that's inside of it is a thick steel tube and I've never taken this one apart I'm not going to take it apart because it's not my knife and but I do know that these these caps do come out but they're extremely hard to get out they're not easy to get out I watched a person do it on the on YouTube and they had to use a, a knife and they pried it open pried it out and then they showed the inside of it it's like a steel tube Seven point two ounces, so that's probably definitely lighter than this one. The Russian knife, the Phoenix Two. Nine point seven. What was the trench knife? Eight point five. So it goes in this order. Heaviest to lightest. None of these knives are meant to be bushcrafting knives. None of them are meant for that purpose. These are all combat knives. They're meant for stabbing and taking out your enemy. That's their, that's their main function. They're combat knives. This one has also been a bayonet. This one was turned into a bayonet. And these three are just soldiers' combat knives, field knives. Probably out of all these, I think the one that has probably the best cutting would be the best for, the, you know, actually, you know, using as a knife for cutting things would probably be the Russian one because of the way it's not so thick behind the edge like all the others are. And this one cuts like a razor. Let's show, let's, let's show what the, the Russian knife can do. Cuts like a razor. Let's see what the, the new one, on, new kid on the block can do. Lucky's knife. Stopping right there, so you probably got a burr right there. Because the edge looks perfectly fine. But I have heard that these often don't come super sharp. And I can feel the burrs on this one right in here. It feels like it needs to be stropped. There's no deformation in the blade at all. The, the edge looks perfectly fine. It just feels like it needs to be stropped. If Lucky want me to, wants me to, I'll strop it for him. But anybody that ever sends me a knife to review for him, I will not mess with your knife. I will not change anything on your knife. 
I won't sharpen it or anything unless you ask me to, you know, to, you know, to hook up the edge a little bit or something like that, then I, that's what I would do. But I would never do it unless you told me to do that. I would leave your knife just the way you sent it to me. I actually really like this knife. And I think I, I can see how it's, you know, a great soldier's knife. Why? Because it's light. It's super light. And so like if you're carrying a bunch of gear, ammo and your weapons, I don't know what the soldiers carry nowadays because I'm sure they carry more probably different things than we carry back in my day. But back in my day, we had like 60 pound packs and they had all our, our essential items and ammo and everything in it. And then we'd probably take them. Then we used to also take turns um, carrying like the M60 or, you know, packing the M60 or the heavier weapons. So soldier, uh, our fellow soldiers wouldn't get so worn out carrying them, the ones that were assigned to them. My weapon was an M203. This one's a double-edged knife. It wasn't that heavy. Yeah, you know, it's an M16. It was an M16 with a grenade launcher on it. And that's the weapon I had after I went to Pathfinder's training in Bad Tolls, Germany. Battalion Pathfinder's training. Because I got tired of being a mechanic. <laughs> so I went to serious grunt work. <laughs> Let's see how sharp this one is. Razor, see if the other side's razor. Razor, <laughs> love it, love it, love it. This one's a 1095 Crow Van um, steel blade. This one's 1095 Crow Van also. This one is 1095 HC. It's pre, it's a pre Crow Van knife. Um, this one's Oz8, and this one's 1090, 1095 HC also. See how, see how sharp the K-bar is. Got yeah, another piece of paper here, another piece of scratch paper. Razor. And we didn't check this one yet, huh? The M3 trench knife. That one could use some work. It's ripping the paper. But it is it does have a super sharp point. <laughs> Absolutely love these knives. I like collecting military stuff and you know not really military stuff per se, but I like military knives. And I've been collecting them for a while. This one's been in my collection a long time. This one's been in my collection a long time. This one's fairly new. And this one's new within the last couple of months. And I got one of these on the way, not this model, I got the FM-81 with the saw back. I couldn't find the FM-78. So I don't know if they're discontinued, I don't know if they're making them anymore. But uh, this model anymore, you know, with the plain, with the plain um, spine. Because I tried to find one, but I couldn't find one. So Lucky's got one that, that, that might be fairly rare now. It's very cool too. Super cool, super cool collectible. And there they are. These are some awesome blades. Now one thing about military knives, I just want to put this out there for anybody that gets into collecting them. Don't ever expect them to be perfect. Because one thing about military knives is that they were mass produced and produced in a hurry to get the soldiers in a hurry, especially like the, the original World War II weapons because it was a major war going on. It was a war war. And everybody got involved in it you know what i mean they, they start hiring women to help build ships in oakland you know rosie the riveter i think that that, that was a that was a um, advertisement that, that they used to have and so like everybody that wasn't involved in combat 
Lots of people were involved in making, you know, uh, naval ships, tanks, uh, military, you know, firearms and weapons and bombs and whatever, whatever a soldier needed. They, everybody got involved in making it. They were cutting out different things like, you know, like making silk stockings and stuff because they needed the silk, I believe, for paratro um, parachutes. And, and so every, everybody got totally involved in it. It's probably one of the times when our country really got got and you know got over a lot of its uh, idiosyncrasies like racism and prejudice and and being chauvinistic and all that kind of stuff because everybody had to, everybody realized that they needed to to unite for the war effort and to defeat an evil enemy Hitler. And one of the good things that came about it is that after the war was over, even though a lot of racism and everything still existed in our country, it was starting to be the beginning of the end of it. It was starting to be the ending of the Jim Crow era because everybody, you know, went to war and they, they fought with other soldiers that were, that were, uh, you know, that they didn't never grow up with or that's, you know, like, like, like black and Asian soldiers you know I, know I know they put the Japanese in concentration camps because of, of all the fear that you know people had about people of Asian descent and which was totally evil and wrong because they were putting people in concentration camps that were American citizens born here in the United States they were just American as anybody else but still Japanese a lot of Japanese, a lot of Japanese individuals joined the military, and and they they became famous fighters in Europe. Just like with the African Americans, the Tuskegee Airmen. There's a lot of history in in a World War II that's really cool. A lot of a lot of things that our country needed to overcome. That they our country overcame it during a time of war, World War, and World War II. And they, a lot of people gain respect for each other. And that's really where it starts, huh? People gotta have respect for you. People don't respect you, then it's hard for them to to want to communicate with you and get to know you and everything else. It's one thing that you know. I don't. I don't like the idea of war, but m one thing that always is sort of good about war. I hate to say something's good about war, but it often has a a, a good. The good thing about war is that it unites people. People that thought they, they, they didn't like each other before. Because when you go into combat, you're depending on your you depend on your fellow soldier to cover your ass when you're in combat. Just like you're gonna cover their ass. Your posterior portion of their physical anatomy. I shouldn't say that the ASS word, right? <laughs> but y'all everybody everybody, you know, depends on everybody in order to survive. And I come from a family of soldiers. There have been a lot, a lot of my fa people in my family. I'm a peacetime soldier. I never went into combat. I was in the military from 79 to 80, 85. And I was in the Army, infantry. I was a tank mechanic. And then on my second enlistment, when I got out in 82, I went back in, re-enlisted as a combat medic, 91 Alpha. My first MLS was 63 Charlie. Stationed in Europe. I spent time in Europe, and then also spent time in the stateside too. Stateside, the main place that I, I really liked being at or was at Fort Hood, which is named after a Civil War general, I think, <laughs> something like that, <laughs> a Confederate general. But it's kind of weird how our country does. You know, we named a lot of things after Confederate um, soldiers and stuff like that. I think we're the only ones that have ever done that, because usually when one one uh, one side beats the other side. They don't glorify the other side that they were up against. That's the way history usually works, but not in that case. But anyway, let's get off that subject. <laughs> but uh, at Fort Hood, I was under I was under General Patton's son. He was the, he was the the commander of Fort Hood when I was there, and that's why I sort of like this one. I mean, it's like. I think this, out of all these, this one's my favorite. 
number one, I just sort of like daggers. Maybe the one reason why I like daggers is because they're forbidden in California. You cannot have a double-edged weapon in California. So, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, you always, I'm, you know, like most people, I think I'm always attracted to what I'm not supposed to be having. <laughs> And you can own these in California, you know, you can collect them, but you cannot carry this. This would be a felony in California, carrying something like this. Never want to carry a double-edged weapon in California. But I think this knife is so badass. I think this is the most badass out of the bunch. Absolutely love that EK-44. It's my favorite combat knife. Even though, you know, this one has history because I used to own one of these. I owned a World War II one of these that my father gave me that he carried for about 30 something years. He gave it to me when I was a teenager as a hunting knife. But when he gave it to me, it was all beat up and everything. And I just, I didn't really realize what it was or anything like that, you know, because I hadn't been in the military yet and I didn't know about all the history of everything. All I knew about was partying and Drinking beer and smoking pot, you know, that's pr and riding motorcycles. And I used to like to hunt with my pops, you know, go bird hunting and shooting and trying to out shoot them and, you know, shoot more birds down than he did, and, you know, get my limit faster and all that kind of stuff. My favorite kind of hunting was dove hunting. But um, I, didn't, I didn't really respect blades yet. I, I wasn't there yet. That came later. And it pretty much came after my pops passed away. Then I started thinking about things. I, I started wishing I would have kept this. I would have kept that. I wish that my mom didn't give away everything that he, you know, that he had just because I was in the military and I didn't have no place to keep it. So she gave everything away to all my relatives and stuff. They got more of my father's mementos than I do. But uh, that's okay, because I replaced them. I replaced them. But these are my these are my combat blades, and I absolutely love this one. I think it's a great addition to my collection. Now I got the, you know, with the the Austrian knife, the German knife. You know what I'm saying? Combat knife. This knife they have. And it's a perfect addition since I, especially since I have a Russian one, right? I have what Russia has, <laughs> and you know what? Russia knows how to make a knife. This knife is awesome. This is an awesome blade. Russians are serious about making their blades. They're taking, they're taking, they take, they take their uh, military uh, pretty seriously, I would say. It's an awesome blade. I know when I was in Germany, our life expectancy was five minutes if we were to go to war with Russia, and that's pretty much all we did was train for six years to go to go to war with Russia. We had reforgers that we participated in that's all we did was train and train and train every other three months we were in the field training to fight Russians out in the field our job was to go to the folder gap and plant landmines and sit there and fight as the Russians tried to come through and the Russian military was considered to be a, a very advanced military back in those days there weren't no slouches, just like they're not slouches now. They just have bad leadership. Thank God. <laughs> I don't know what Putin's doing. He needs to call it quits and have his people go home. He's making Russia being... Russia was on its way to being, you know, like part of the rest of the world. And then Putin has set them back, you know, decades now. It's going to be a long time before people trust Russia again. Because Russia, Russia was on its way to being, you know, part of the world's economy. I don't, know, I don't know what Putin thought he was doing. But anyway. Because whether, they, whether they, you know, they win or lose, it really doesn't matter. They're still, still going to lose. Because they've lost the respect and from the rest of from the rest of the world they've exposed themselves and i feel sorry for the, the the good russian people in russia 
I've listened to documentaries from you know people that are in Russia that are against the war, and it it's, it's, it brings tears to your eyes the way that they feel about what's going on. They're totally against what's going on in Ukraine. I bet, and I would be willing to bet that a lot of people who say that they're for, you know, following uh, Putin or whatever, they say it out of fear. Because Putin is feared in his own country. It's not like, it's not like our country where you can say whatever you want, pretty much, and, and uh, protest and do all that kind of stuff. You can't do all that stuff in Russia. You get arrested. They put you in prison. If not kill you take you out. Putin has been known for taking out his opponents forever. And he calls himself a president, but presidents don't stay in office for what, 20 years or whatever it is? He's a dictator. But anyway, these are my military military weapons, or military knives. A good, a good selection of them. These are all the ones that I've actually served. I didn't bring out the other ones that that are like um, new versions of the K-Bar and, and all the other knives that I have that are, you know, combat knives made by Cold Steel and, and the other ones I've made by K-Bar. About the ones that, that have actually been known to have served time in the military. And why? Because this is a real military knife. The Austrian FM-78. And it's not, you know, it's not the most beautiful knife or anything like that, but it is a real soldier's knife. That's what makes it cool to me. Because I understand that, you know, real soldier's knives and real soldier's equipment often is made, you know, by people who get a contract to make it from the government. And they're not making it like for civilians where civilians are going to go out and, you know, decide whether they want to buy something or not. These knives are, are issued, to, issued to the soldiers. They don't have a choice. They have to take these. Now, if they want to buy something on their own, they can't. They usually can, but these are the ones that they're issued. But anyway, let me see. What else we have, we haven't done out here? We haven't we haven't measured. We haven't gone to the limits of them, huh? We'll go through that real quick, and then we'll just wrap this video up. Blade length on the K bar seven inches. Handle length looks like five inches. Total length, 12 inches. And on the EK, we got, let me see, one, two, three, four, five eighths. One, two, three, four, five. Looks like six and five eighths. Total length is 12 and five eighths. Handle length. Six inches. The Russian Phoenix 2, blade length is five, uh, six and seven eighths, almost seven inches. Total length is 11 and six eighths. Handle it. Looks like about five inches. The trench knife, M3 trench knife. One, two, three, four, five, six eighths. Six and six eighths. Is that about the same as this one? Six and this one's back right at about seven eighths. Okay. Handle length five inches. Total length eleven and one, two, three, four, five eighths. Blade length on the on the Austrian trench knife. I mean Austrian field knife is six and one, two, three. I'll call it four eighths. One, two, three, four eighths. Not quite four eighths, but I'll call it four eighths. Handle length is five inches. Total length, 11 and three eighths. That's about it for these.
Let's go ahead and put them back in the sheets. Let you guys get a look at them before I put in the sheet. Thank you, Lucky. Lucky's giving me some awesome, awesome knives to review this week. Got a couple more of his to do. And I'll be giving them back to him. These are awesome, awesome blades. I had to go get one of these. Did I show you the markings? Because this has the new type of markings and the handle. That's the way the markings should look now. And the blade markings. Because I understand there's counterfeits out there of these. So if you're getting it off of eBay or something, be careful. I would go to like Midway and get something because Midway's going to, they don't sell counterfeit stuff. The, the, all their stuff is legit. So when you buy something from Midway, you can feel, you know, safe. You can feel like, you know, you know that you got something that you're supposed to be having. Love the Phoenix. These are awesome. I want to get the bigger one. I want the original Phoenix one. I have a wild pig hunter. And I got it because of these. But actually, I got the wild pig hunter. I saw that one first, the Topps wild pig hunter. And then I found out that, that um, the wild pig hunter was um, made from like this design. And that's what made me look into the Russian knife. And when I saw this one, and I saw it being demonstrated on YouTube, put, put through its, uh, you know, see how it's shown how strong it is and everything. Person was throwing with it, they were batoning with it, chopping with it, they were doing all sorts of stuff with it. And I saw how tough it was, I, I, I wanted one. This is a really nice blade. Highly recommend it if you can get one. I know they're really hard to get right now, because of what's going on in Ukraine. So these are extremely tough to get right now. May not be able to, you know, be able to have a good supply of them until after the war is over. And things chill back out. This is my favorite. This is my favorite out the bunch. This is super badass. I love this one. It has a nice sheath too. The sheath works really nice for it too. I'm sure it's a glass filled um, sheath. I don't think it's a Kydex or whatever, but it's still a nice sheath. And the one my pops had for, um, let me show you this one again. The K bar that my pops had, it had a fiberglass sheath. It didn't have a sheath like that was leather. You had like a, a green fiberglass sheath that's made to, to hook onto your web gear or your web belt. Absolutely love them. But there they are, people. Peace out. Stiletto.